welcome to uh, the Annenberg Research Seminar for this week. We're delighted to have Daphne Brooks from Princeton with us today. Uh, today's meeting is co-sponsored with the Norman, the Norman Lear Center. And uh, the person who has helped put all this together and coordinated all, all of uh, the, the session for us today is Josh Kuhn, who's serving as the faculty uh, host for today. So Josh, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Those of you who are in the back, um, I guess, standing room only. That's how Daphne does it. Um, <laughs> no. We expected anything less. Uh, this is a really an amazing opportunity for the Popular Music Project of the Norman Lear Center to join forces with the Annenberg uh, Research Seminar Series. Um, personally, it's just very important to me that um, the two kind of different ways of thinking and approaching culture, the arts, and media can actually occupy the same room. So I think it's really important that, um, that we're actually working together on this one today. And I think Daphne's work is a, is a great place for those conversations to happen. Um, I really do want to thank um, everybody involved with the seminar series for their help in putting this together. Uh, the Norman Lear Center, uh, Marty Kaplan, Joanna Blakely, Scott McGiven, who's going to be the DJ and everything else up here. Uh, Leslie Wong, who's back there, who is indispensable. Um, for me, the, the kind of joy of being able to, to invite people to come and give talks is that not only do you get to bring people whose work is rigorous and important um, in the field, but also people who can do something far greater than the work itself, which is inspire you um, and change the way you think and completely energize um, the way we think about the arts and particularly popular music. Um, Daphne Brooks is the living definition of that notion. Um, she, to call her a wide-ranging scholar does not quite do the trick. Um, she's somebody who can teach courses on African-American literature and performance, as well as courses, I think, that you just finished on rock criticism, right? I did, yeah. Um, uh, write a book on one single album by the late singer Jeff Buckley, uh, his record Grace, as well as a, uh, another book that's just a little bit longer than the Jeff Buckley book <laughs> um, on 19th century transatlantic um, uh, Diaspora performance in vaudeville, <laughs> magic shows, <laughs> dance, uh, and theater. Someone who can write scholarly essays with one hand and then send off an essay about Beyonce to the nation um, with the other, uh, an essay that, that caused a lot of wonderful commentary across the country. Um, someone who can give talks on the African American women uh, behind the career of Bob Dylan, uh, as she did just yesterday at the Skirball Museum, and then come across town uh, to talk about the diaspora mixology of alt-rock favorites TV on the radio, which she's going to do for us today. Um, there's really, for me, no one who's more fun and more energizing uh, when she talked about popular music and popular culture, a real model of public, into public intellectual life uh, for me, and I think, as you'll see, for all of you. She's been a fellow with the Ford Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, the Woodrow Wilson yeah. Career Enhancement <laughs> Fellowship Program. Uh -uh. University of California, HRI, and the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute uh, at Harvard. Um, and I want to just end by saying that a couple years ago, I was in the audience, as I think uh, at least a handful of us in this room were, uh, in Seattle at the EMP um, when Daphne talked over um, the classic Journey ballad, uh, <laughs> Lights. Um, and she'll sing it for you in the Q&A. Right. Um, yes. And to ev I think it's safe to say to everyone uh, who was in that room, um, she took us on this, on this journey into the inner workings of music, of fandom, uh, into the story of her own family, uh, into stories of cross-racial identification, um, and most importantly, uh, for at least some people in the room, but not me, her own love of Bay Area baseball. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've never been Hater. able to hear that song uh, in any other way than the way that she talked about it. And I think that is the, the greatest gift and the greatest trick and the greatest magic that any scholar can pull off uh, is to, in talking about popular music or in talking about popular culture, make it her own. Um, so it's a real honor and a real treat that Daphne Brooks is here. So Daphne Brooks. Uh, um, okay. That was, I am not worthy, um, Josh Kuhn. Um, and I, I have to extend my thanks to Josh, which I want to come back to in a second. But um, I want to thank you all for coming out. I know the lunchtime hour is a um, condensed hour and that people are going to have to leave, and, and that's absolutely fine. But I'm so happy to see you all here. Um, and I want to start by saying that um, of late, I've been on this version of the Jackson's Victory Tour, but without the sparkly costumes, the polyrhythmic um, shake your body down to the ground dance moves, or the jerry curls. 
Um, but I've been on the road in Toronto for a blackface minstrelsy conference on Friday. Across town, as Josh was saying, at the Skirball Center yesterday for a Dylan conference. Um, and now here, which feels like home, to see so many of my favorite people. And where finally I get to talk about black people who rock. So thank you very much. Um, so enormous thanks to, to Josh and to actually many of the people in this room who've shaped my work in so many ways. Um, for this invitation, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and also special thanks to Leslie Wong um, for organizing every detail of the trip for me. So um, this talk is about 45 minutes-ish long. Oh, are we doing, what's happening? <laughs> OK, cool, you know, technology, new technology, never, that's fine. Um, it's about 45 minutes-ish in length. I hope you won't have to use the Dave Chappelle um, wrap it up box on me. Um, but signposts are always good. So when we get to post-colonial temporalities, you're halfway there. Um, when we reach um, the discussion about the falsetto voice, we're coming around the bend to the end. And again, I, I understand if people need to leave. So OK. So indie rock music wonks, start your engines. This ain't your brother's TV on the radio. And this definitely ain't the band dubbed Runner Up Artist by the Village Voice 2006 annual Paz and Jop Rock Critics Poll either. There we go. Um, the one whose guitarist, vocalist, Williamsburg boho style maven, Kip Malone, um, appeared in what is a now infamous David O'Keefe cartoon on the cover of The Voice's Chris Gowless Taste Poll Bible, flattened out like a pancake on the sidewalk by an equally caricatured bicycle riding modern times Dylan. As feckless, outrageous, and inflammatory as that image was, one reader commented that, quote, I honestly thought it was Michael Richards running over a random black man. <laughs> my, my task today is not to stage a Don Imus Al Sharpton showdown with that downtown paper currently perpetually in disarray. I'll leave that to Antibalis Afrobeat Orchestra saxophonist Martin Perna, who laid waste to the Voice's editorial staff in an open letter to the paper in which he called the drawing racist, unfunny, mean-spirited, and inaccurate. Nowhere in the consciousness of voice editors or illustrator David O'Keefe, says Perna, can we find memories of James Byrd, a black man who was dragged behind a truck to his death by white racists in Jasper, Texas in 1998, or Arthur J.R. Warren, who was run over four times and killed for being black and gay in West Virginia in 2000, and all the other lynchings that happened in the US before and since. Racism aside, the drawing is snarky and simple-minded, continues Perna. Where is the love? Why such a nasty way to portray two fantastic musical entities who made award-winning records in 2006? This paper, then, is an attempt on my part to shift the discussion of the band TV on the radio back not only to the subject of loving this group, a group who elicits the most intense indie swooning at art school student parties from Silver Lake to Red Hook, but what I hope to do as well is to talk a bit about the specificities of black love coupled with despair, alienation coupled with transcendence, and transnational identifications that undergird the very foundations of TV on the radio's music. And so I'm going to start by playing a snippet for one of TV on the radio's most famous tracks, <laughs> oh, tech, um, off of their breakthrough 2004 EP. And it's a song called Staring at the Sun, which we can see. Don't look at my playlist over the sun. <laughs> say you, you question the relevance of discussing black identity politics 
in relation to a band whose music appears to follow few to none of the putative master scripts that define the relationship between blackness and music? To be sure, you wouldn't be the first. Consider the discussion that emerged several years ago on the marvelous online girl group Rock Critics Forum, in which the thoughtful question was raised by Pitchfork.com journalist Amy Phillips as to whether or not it's, quote, racist to bring up TV on the radio's racial makeup when writing about them. List co-founder Daphne Carr weighed in by discussing one of her pieces on the band, how she, quote, tried to deal with this overwhelming fetishization of soul or the fascination with the black hipster that has been a big part of the post-war white pop vanguard. TV on the radio are black, these articles seem to say, but they're just like us being the, un uh, us being the unmarked. But I would add, quite belatedly to this conversation, that the issue is not necessarily whether to write about race with regards to the band, but simply one of how to write about it in ways that open up new connections to their music, and that likewise spark the occasion for thinking about the persistent silences in how we write about racial identity formations in rock music criticism. Can you bring that down just a little bit? In other words, what are the ways that we might rigorously engage with the racial presumptions and mythologies that, of course, already factor in the ways that rock critics write about New York indie rock darlings, Vampire Weekend, or English indie faves, the Arctic Monkeys, and even imagine this grand pappy indie man himself, Dylan, as well. Or to put it another way, as the fabulous black feminist rock critic Candia Crazy Horse argued, in her own post uh, during what she called the TV on the radio crisis on Girl Group, quote, white boy crits are writing about race and gender whenever they write about other white men, if only by the pervasive fact of omission mm -hmm. equals they get to exist in a bubble where they don't have to A, self-consciously think about being a white male before they write one word, and B, they can breezily get through their, way, their day without thinking of the existence of blacks and other minorities. So because whiteness is normative in the West, they are allowed delusion about their power with the pen or otherwise. But in fact, whiteness is a category too, and since their white male agency is defined by a rejection of the other, the difference between them and the very African lead singer Tunde Adabempe is noted if only euphemistically. So they are always writing about race on some level, end quote. Just as well, instead of presuming, like one list member, that their music appears to bear, quote, no overt similarity to the dr tradition of black rock, Curtis Mayfield, Prince, Shuggy Otis, or Jimi Hendrix, and therefore seems artificial, end quote, the bigger challenge, it seems, with TV on the radio is that they force us as listeners to put pressure on how we define and imagine the historical, social, and political dimensions of black music, and no, I haven't forgotten about the all-important role of the band's guitarist, keyboardist, loop wizard, white boy, David Sitek. More on him later. Following my colleague Mindy Obadike's lead in her work on sound, racial stereotypes, and representations of blackness in American music, film, and literature, we would do well to examine what it means to identify something as black music, what associations are made when one defines something as black, and how that relates to greater ideas of cultural connections and identity. Obadike underscores the ways that we might recognize how our consumption of music intersects with notions of cultural or racial identity and stereotypes. And of course, we should recognize the ways in which this impulse to racially stereotype sound is not just a white indie rock phenomenon. Critic John Caramonica has discussed with the band their own observations on being, quote, all but ignored by black media, AKA, I'm sorry to say, the Lenny Kravitz lament. We did something for men's health, but we've never been approached by Ebony, Bunton <laughs> notes. Why not, he continues, the bottleneck of black culture can be so restrictive. I look at some of the outlandish performers in the black community and wonder, how can we still be so conservative sometimes? What would it take to work against certain pre-existing ideas about race, or masculinity for that matter, and the music of TV on the radio, rather than eschewing the ways that this band channels equal parts Per Ubu and Peter Gabriel in their dystopic noise epics, what would it take to place those recognizable influences in conversation with sounds and dreamscapes, dreamscapes cultivated in the material abstraction that is black Atlantic culture, Fila and Semben, James Brown and Charles Burnett, 
Nina, Nat King Cole, and the Fisk Jubilee singers all cut and mixed and looped round and round into a sonically defamiliarized middle passage wall of sound, one that's bigger and more ominous and more specter and more spectral sounding than the confines of the indie rock universe. We are so low tech here, I need that next track now. that today's rock scribes had brushed up on some Portent spillers in order to hear the historical static coursing through the lower frequencies of this Af Afro-Anglo New York experimental ensemble's recordings. In one, of, in one of her many bad brains, hardcore punk rock moves, Spillers challenges her readers in Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe to understand the history of slavery as a problem excruciatingly bound up with time. She points to the paradox of the Middle Passage and what it means for people of African descent to have been suspended in time while simultaneously moving through oceanic space. For Spillers, the project becomes to try and take apart time, racial time itself, to address the ways in which black bodies subjected to forced migration are placed in a complex web of contradictory and confounding notions of time and timelessness. Listen to the postmodern doo-wop doo dirge of ambulance, a track we'll hear later, God willing, or the, inter -oce or the inter oceanic goth blues of Dirty World, what we're listening to right now from the album Return to Cookie Mountain. And you can hear the sound of a band cutting through the stillness of rock time, stealing fra fragments of Peter Lochner's punk wave while turning out, staring at the sun raw bursts of the ethereal and funkadelic hardcore jollies walking a tightrope of musical influences that play with and at the margins of past, present, and future not-so-lovely sounds. Following the marvelous strides made by Alexander Wahaley, I could be messing up his last name, but his work is amazing, to trace the phonographies of sonic Afro-modernity from Du Bois through contemporary transnational hip-hop, dub, and trans cultures, my work on TV on the radio aims to open up conversations about Afro-diasporic subjectivity as it plays out aurally, and in this case, at the site of rock and post-rock genealogies. In the broader project, I'm trying to listen for the ways that TV on the radio's dystopic rock soundscapes perform a kind of diasporic rock citizenship that rewrites supposed racial ge geographies in popular music culture. As critic Rob Fields would have it, following the groundbreaking work of Greg Tate, Maureen Mann, Candia Crazy Horse, and others, quote, Black rock works in opposition to the idea that you're supposed to know the boundaries and stay within them. Black rock is, at first, an invitation for African Americans to take the red pill from the matrix. It's an invitation to break the frame of things we take for granted, what we listen to, avenues through which we can express ourselves, even notions of what it means to be authentically black. So how does black rock perform a kind of diasporic consciousness by way of its, its epistemological insurgencies with regards to race and cultural expression. Today I want to examine the way that black, uh, the way that black diaspora as concept works, works itself out in the sounds of TV on the radio and how this marvelously original band recenters the idea of transatlantic black nationhood in the unfixed location of space in the rapturous intervals of remixed time. Their music, I argue, is the sound of transnational alienation, an extended call and response performance of post-black disidentifications and post-colonial melancholia, 
transmitted and transmutated into beautifully eerie dissenting feedback. Theirs is the kind of noise that whirs and hums on top of the ghostly roots and roots that Sadia Hartman traces and travels in her recent book, Lose Your Mother, a work that is part memoir, part elegy, part crit critical rumination, and one in which Hartman travels the transnational divide as an African-American in search of the buried histories of the 12 million who crossed the Atlantic Ocean, in search of a past that is not yet over, in search not of healing but of excavating a wound, in search of the afterlife of slavery, and one in which she recognizes that she too, that we all are, and that I would obviously add rock and roll itself is the afterlife of slavery. To tumble the barricade between an as yet not fully recognized then and now, staging mythical returns and departures in the wake of perpetually rehearsed catastrophes and disasters, this is the music of TV on the radio, a music that is, I want to suggest, historically and materially black by virtue of the fact that this band is the sonic equivalent of what theorist Brent Edwards has influentially referred to as the practice of diaspora. Holla if you hear me, Usman Semben, that's for Kara in the room. <laughs> Holla with an X, Usman Semben's um, wonderful film, Holla. Bigger and blacker. They came from Kentucky, Long Island by way of Trinidad, Nigeria, Baltimore, and Pittsburgh, and ended up in post 9-11 Williamsburg, Brooklyn, actively in search, as Chris Martins of Filter has put it, of something other than stifling sameness. Gerard Smith, a, classic, uh, <coughs> a classical and flamenco guitar guitarist turned bassist, born to Trinidadian parents who took their children home for carnival each year. Louisville native guitarist turned drummer Jaleel Bumpton, the son of a college professor and an international basketball player. Cotton candy froed guitarist, vocalist Kip Malone, a Jehovah's Witness raised Pittsburgh nomad who bounced his way across both coasts before ending up in the borough. Baltimore native guitarist, keyboardist, production experimentalist, David Sitek, the white guy, more about him later, and, <laughs> and, and vocalist Tunde Adabempe, the son of a psychiatrist and a pharmacist, the emotional center of the band, and the front man whose Nigeria to Pittsburgh back and forth upbringing has often led to critics transforming him into an exotic synecdoche for the band's Africanness. So let me be clear, my aim is not to do that here. Instead, I'm interested in having us think more about the internal encounters that shape the metaphorically global dimensions of the band, the ways that TV on the radio is black Atlantic makeup, one that fittingly brings together African, Caribbean, Anglo-American, and African-American familial genealogies, manifests the kinds of transnational circuits of black modern expression that Edwards argues takes form not as a single thread, but through the often uneasy encounters of peoples of African descent with each other. <coughs> the cultures of black internationalism, he suggests, are formed only within the paradoxes. Internationalism <coughs> involves a process of linking or connecting across gaps, and it creates and articulates what he has famously termed an instance of decalage. Decalage, it can be translated as gap, discrepancy, time lag, or interval. It is also the term that French speakers sometimes use to translate jet lag. Decalage is either a difference or a gap in time, advancing or delaying a schedule, or in space, shifting or displacing an object. Black diasporic decalage is a different kind of interface. It is a changing core of difference. It is, as Stuart Hall asserts, and as Edwards cogently re reiterates, the work of differences within unity. This notion of a shifting difference within has become something of a literal trademark of a band whose lore involves an extended period of widening its membership. Adabempe and Sitek recruited Malone, <coughs> and by turns recruited Bunton and Smith, literally layering styles and techniques and influences and waves of progression. Likewise, their evolving recording practices have been equally cyclical. Rarely was the whole band in the studio at the same time for their most recent album, which meant that different permutations of ideas were constantly in rotation. As critic John Caramonica notes, the group's unspoken mandate to be five individuals working on one project rather than one sound drafting five people to execute it has created something of a challenge as they respond to the demands of a rock music press in search of a label, a face, some kind of mythical and racially marked unity in sound. 
preoccupied with textures and tension above any fidelity to traditional structures, as Caramonica puts it. And here he rightly compares the band to their kindred English counterparts, Radiohead. TV on the radio's insistence on interfacing the different variegated and fascinating sounds as much blues and gospel and doo-wop and electronic as post-punk and noise is a way of remastering blackened musical time as a reminder, a remainder, and an Afrofuturist aspiration. What are the kinds of diasporic time signatures the TV on the radio is generating in their music? What are the ways in which their sound is ideologically akin to the kind of queer time that Judith Halberstam, Elizabeth Freeman, and others allude to as that which resists white heteronormative hegemonic temporalities and geographies? Just as queer renderings of postmodern geography generate the notion of a body-centered identity which gives way to a model that locates sexual subjectivities within and between embodiment, place, and practice, so too might we think of TV on the radio's music as playing with tropes of diasporic disidentification, the time lag between here and an undefined there, and the ways that musical narratives can themselves respond to this disjuncture. Indeed, as Simon Gikandi reminds us, post-colonial theories of globalization insist that this displacement of European time and modernity in general takes place in the arena of art, culture, or more appropriately, the imaginary. TV on the radio's music like the post-colonial and queer temporalities of which Kakandi, Freeman, Halberstam each speak, exist in an uneasy dialectical relation with the politics of modern time and historicism, but nonetheless understands that what has not entered the historical records and what is not yet culturally legible is often encountered in embodied non-rational forms as ghosts, scars, gods. And so I'm interested in listening to the ways that the gaps, the hiccups, the massive overlay of blistering static and noise that we've already heard in, say, Tricky's pre-millennially tense translation of Public Enemy from his late 90s trip-hop experimentalism gets re-outfitted by way of musicians who are also actors and painters and busking <coughs> bandits and one white studio wonk with an ear for futzing around with the eccentricities of recorded sound. To answer the question posed by Pitchfork, quote, but what's their message? They're not here to rock, they use too many loops, too much repetition, and too little chaos. But what kind of chaos are we looking and listening for here in the first place? In the same way that the mythos of America fuels the dreams and nightmares and disappointments and desires of Woody Guthrie, Dylan, and Springteen, Springsteen, and yes, even Africa's red-shirted champion Bono, we might speculate on the way that African diaspora is both an abstraction and a material fact play out in the work of this band and how the tales of the diaspora, although inextricably linked to America, are their own beast beastly whales as well. A stranger in the village. We need more music here. Music would be good throughout. There we go. That's fine. Number three. Thank you. Released almost to the date of the fifth anniversary of 9-11, September 12th, 2006, Return to Cookie Mountain is TV on the radio's second full-length album, following their 2004 shortlist prize-winning Desperate Youth Blood Bloodthirsty Babes LP, as well as 2003's Young Liars EP, 2004's New Health Rock EP, and the self-released David Sitek and Tunde Adabimpe duo recording entitled OK Calculator from 2002. 
Cookie Mountain is, to quote numerous critics on the subject, an album in which atmosphere is everything. This music, foreign and huge, to quote Chris Martins and Filter, is the unlikely offspring of post-rock and black spiritual music, pounded life, pounded life on, this, on sampler pads, and swaddled in atmosphere. It's a record that evokes intense magnitude through a massive plateau of sound that is both daunting and yet beckons to be traversed. I Was a Lover, the album's opening track, which we're listening to, blurts out a scuzzy, static-laden rhythm, a slouching beat, the afterlife of an everything but the girl or massive attack sample, wrestling with what Chris Dolan calls the emotional sample on the record, a bellow like the sound of a sad ele elephant. I was a lover before this war, held up in a luxury suite behind a barricaded door, Tunde sings through this post-industrial maze of noise, dropping you down into the center of a muted, jet-lagged war zone. Each track lyrically transports you through the detritus of the borderlands of flood zones, deposits you at the bottom of a well or after a hurricane. As the New York Times' John Perellas observes, catastrophes have occurred and this album contemplates their aftermath. It is a record that yokes disaster and destruction with futurist transformation. There's something about this cacophony that is resilient, romantic, melancholic, a soundtrack for the domain of what Hartman refers to as the Abruni, the Ghanaian word meaning stranger. The domain of the stranger, Hartman argues, is always an elusive elsewhere. And so Cookie Mountain, with its Pan's Labyrinth whimsical title, takes us to the land of elsewhere, which is yet still oh so familiar. What Tunde sees double while locked in his bedroom on I Was a Lover, mano a mano on a bed of nails. Next track. Repetition, we love it in the, our post-structuralist world. Um, these are the tales of Midnight's other children, born in the wake of the lapsed alliance between African independence, African-American civil rights movements, and black power struggles. This is the age, as Hartman reminds, not of dreaming, but of disenchantment. These are the epic stories of severed kin, of transnational ruptures and realignments, of love and betrayal, of pleasure-filled cultural encounters and startling alienation in the diaspora. Make no mistake, there are ghosts on this record, but not the kind of ghosts, kinds of ghosts that populate the mythologies of Moby's playground. These are the ghosts of the stories of those who had left no record of their lives and whose biography consisted of the terrible things said about them or done to them. If America's Civil War could endlessly inspire the lyrical stunts and thematic impulses of Bob Dylan, Who's to say that the dispersed and volatile histories of the diaspora do not inform this band emerging from the branches of black forced migration and interracial encounter and coalescing in a fight against the toxic tranquility of a post 9-11 New York City falling back into its, Rudy into its Rudy Giuliani violent cultural myopia and insularity. Suggestively elegiac, Cookie Mountain articulates the band's multilateral engagement with the embattled local, New York City, the national, in its mournful and aggressive critiques of US neocon initiatives, and the transnational, in its effort to perform heterogeneous black musical affiliations as oppositionality. This is a band that proudly calls Williamsburg its home, and even if more than a few of us are wary of that bur borough's rapid gentrification, like so many other hoods of color around the nation, we might still think about the ways that local New York City avant-garde cultures enables the band, enable the band to engage in the kind of conviviality which Paul Gilroy describes as a form of post-cosmopolitan solidarity. The radical openness that brings conviviality alive, he argues, makes a nonsense of closed, fixed, and reified identity and turns attention toward the always unpredictable mechanisms of identification. Conviviality, I would argue, makes it possible for someone like Sitek to collaborate in the band's musical project that runs along the simultaneous axes of the local and the planetary. Conviviality enables this band to toggle between Brooklyn white indie music scenes and a black tri-state musical bohemia 
led by Amir Questlove Thompson and others, who's pictured here from the roots, probably wondering as he joined TV on the radio if he hasn't, but they're collaborating together. But the planetary vision of this album is one that puts pressure on this millennial moment marked by global fragility. The brilliant trick of Cookie Mountain, as John Tolan puts it in Spin, is that it is able to turn the dystopian wallow of Radiohead's Kid A on its ear, finding a shocked freedom and alienation. There is a freedom in this alienation the TV on the radio is spinning on this album, freedom in the form of future youth, who Tunde calls out to on the galloping, plateau-traversing track hours that we're listening to right now. Know you're beautiful, aimless, and alive, broken and divine, or walk around, know you are future youth, summoned to the sky. Part of the redemptive project of this record, then, is to create a space in sound in which the alienated, the dispossessed, the disconnected can connect right through what Greg Cott potently refers to as the things fall apart atmosphere of the album. Just like Achebe's post-colonial universe, we are left to contemplate the aftermath of history all ablaze trying to breathe as the world disintegrates, as Tunde, Malone, and guest vocalist David Bowie croon on the bright morning glory anthem province. Young hearts, be free tonight and walk with this band into this dark place and hold your hearts courageously. Love, this track romantically insists, will fuel the spatial reconfigurations of our world. Behold the fifth dimension reincarnated, minus Marilyn McCoo, in all its sublime indie rock splendor. Love will create an asylum for strangers here at the end of time. And next track. Time out of mind. Yep. Yes, thank you. It is this. No. powerful juxtaposition of idealistic hope and dread and drone that makes Cookie Mountain a distinctly powerful black musical wonder. And it is, I would argue, the band's characteristic use of drones and repetition that evoke the situation of diasporic decollage that Edwards describes. Drones and repetition are, to quote Perelez, the music's core. And these noises suggest timelessness and stability. They tug, as he describes it, against stasis. Guitars buzz in from overhead or work up to nerv nervous tremolos. Horn sections materialize out of nowhere. And pianos plink insistent dissonances. The Darwin's Nightmare closing track, Wash the Day Away, drones on until the levees break, until the end of the world. This lag, this time delay, manifests itself across tracks that insist on the dragged beat of Atlantic world consciousness. The post-traumatic stress disorder erupting out of this invisible sun, new world disorder, same as it ever was. In effect, then, it is the use of those drones, to which Perelez alludes, that is perhaps the most resonant trope of diasporic time, a diasporic condition of restless situatedness on this big, quirky, imposing album. How many ways can one think of the metaphoric elusiveness of the drone in the context of TV on the radio's Mountain of Sound? If, at its most basic level, a drone is a musical sound that is held for a very long time, how might the drone signify in the aforementioned situation a historical black stillness moving through oceanic time? How might slight modulations in timbre, color, and texture open up ways of imagining improvisatory ways of doing black identity that disrupts the stillness? Comparative studies theorist Barry Shank's work on the drone in relation to the Velvet Underground's epic dope aria, Heroin, is helpful to me in the ways that he underscores the drone's ability on that record 
to yield a difference within. As Shank reminds, the repeated gestures that enact the droning sound can never be totally identical. They are only ever repeated and necessarily variant iterations. And so we'll hear a little bit from Lou Reed. Intensely loud, harmonically overdriven, temporally extended, dissenter drone is, as Shank reminds, the sound that John Cale took from the Dream Syndicate and presented to the Velvet Underground. And in its intensive, insistent disarticulation, Cale's drone acts, according to Shank, as a cut. It separates the thing in itself, the sounds themselves, Rather than holding together the center, it decenters the field of relations, dispersing meaning beyond any pre-established coherence. We don't have time to listen to all of heroin, but I'm <laughs> here all day. I wanted to evoke the, the memory of that track. Like the Velvet, use of the drone, TV on the radio, make use of a decentering sound that evokes the condition of dispersal and the relations erupting out of those dispersals. If the drone in the blues almost always sounds the tonic and serves as a powerful reminder of the home that is always being escaped and returned to, here it reemerges as home that is in fact dissonance itself. Ultimately, however, as Marc Berger suggests, what cuts through this thicket of static what bridges the gaps and delays and hiccups and crippled percussive gates on the album and on all of the band's work at this point is the drunken sounding, swooning and crooning falsetto <coughs> melodies of Adempe, Adempe and Malone's falsetto harmonies, first stylized by Tunde alone on the stunning hidden track cover of the Pixies' Mr. Greaves, <coughs> carrying through onto the heartbreaking serenade dirge ambulance on Desperate Youth and carrying through again onto Cookie Mountain's hours. And so we'll hear first a little bit of Ambulant. Bunton of his bandmate. Tunde's voice is so classic to me that if there wasn't that juxtaposition, juxtaposition with the tension, the music would just be really easy to digest. It never would have made any difference to me. End quote. But this difference is that which the voice makes here that opens up time and space on this volatile musical terrain. This singing, a conflation of post-war doo-wop, Postbellum Jubilee vocalizing and ethereal gospel ecstasy emerges as what Sharon O'Connell calls a near spiritual strangeness that finally serves as the umbilical cord of black musical production situated in historical time. You say you hear Peter Gabriel warbling through Tunde's thick rising out of the gut phrasings. I say show me a way that the sledgehammer himself isn't indebted to Yusuna Dor's world music balladeering. Those eerie and alluring a cappella voices are, in the end, the narrative coherence that links TV on the radio not just to black soulful, soulful aesthetics, but to one of the key articulations of black masculinity in song. 
As Mark Anthony Neal puts it, the quote, richness of black masculine expression is embedded in falsetto singing. Black, black male falsetto singing is, he argues, the product of hyper-masculinity, as in, you gotta be mackin' for real if you're gonna step to some honey in one of them high-pitched voices that send the roaches scurrying before the lights come on. The falsetto, as Nathaniel Mackey cogently observes, and as Fred Moden and Judith Halberstam have riffed on and taken in a different direction that we can talk about during the Q&A, the falsetto has the ability to operate as a false voice from someone like Al Green, who creatively hallucinates a new world and indicts the more insidious falseness of the world as we know it. Pushed to yet another realm of this crucial black musical lexicon, and one hears not only Curtis and Marvin and Philip Bailey's reach for the sky vocals, but one hears just as well the idea of the kind of deep song, the quality and condition known as duende, articulated by Spanish poet Federico Garcia Lorca, rehearsed and reinterpreted influentially by Mackey as well. The dark sounds of duende that seek the presence and persistence of the otherwise excluded, the otherwise expelled, Duende has to do with trouble, deep trouble. Deep song delves into the troubled water, troubles the water, as Mackie puts it. I would have us to think about the combination of this falsetto with the drone, what Wahili might call a kind of Afro-diasporic tricknology that doubly falsifies, that makes peculiar and new the most overdetermined instrument in black music itself, the black voice. The drone and the falsetto create a different soundscape, different soundscape of duende, deep, odd, and eccentric black song. In short, the vocals are the cyclical return and departure of diasporic identity in transit, transfiguring, unfixed, alien. McTell, Sam Cook, Nina Simone, Mike Padden, anyone who's kind of painting with their voice, that's what I'm going for in my head, Ada Bempe explains, and adding in another interview that as far as vocalist, Nina Simone is probably one of the hugest influences on me. Nina, trouble in mind, Simone, a wild as the wind, black as the color of my true lover's love's hair kind of singer whose motor running vocals manifest a sly, witty, androgynous beauty akin to the kind of African-American fugitivity of which Mackey and Moden have meditated on at length. Braiding together these many voices, TV on the radio transforms the ugly curse of the rope used as a genocidal weapon against black bodies and turns it into a tool of escape from abjection, stillness, historical oblivion. It is the thick vocal thread that holds the album's electrical universe together in time. Still more, these vocals should remind us of Mackey's haunting contention that the quintessential source of music is the orphan's ordeal, an orphan being anyone denied kinship, social sustenance, anyone who suffers social death. Song, he maintains, is both a complaint and a consolation dialectically tied to that ordeal where in back of Orphan, one hears echoes of Orphic, a music that turns on abandonment, absence, loss. Think of the black spiritual motherless child. Music is wounded kinship's last resort, end quote. And so it goes in the, in the closing lyrics of the climactic Wash the Day, when Tunde utters in Yoruba, bye-bye airplane, help me greet them bye-bye. Two corn puddings fills me up, fills me up, fills me up. The return is the departure, is the return on Cookie Mountain, a last resort. And so it goes. Thank you. Thank you, Dex. Uh, we have time for Q&A um, for a little while, and then we also have
have some time as people um, have to leave or stay, um, that if people want to meet individually with Daphne and have a, a more intimate conversation, we can stay here until around 2 o'clock or so um, for you to meet with uh, faculty and students and all that kind of stuff. But we'll start with um, a more open Q&A. Any questions for Daphne? <sighs> Yes. So would you say that, um, well, first I really enjoyed like the whole presentation, which is fabulous. Thank you. So are you ultimately saying that the falsetto yeah. is the key <laughs> element mm -hmm. of the diasporic rock citizenship that's being performed here? Like that crucial mm -hmm. difference mm -hmm. between, for lack of a better phrase, typical mm -hmm. indie mm -hmm. kind of strategies right. and is that falsetto the key difference maker here? It's it's it is one of, of a set of keys. Right, but, the drone but is something absolutely. Else about, but the falsetto right. as well. The drone and the falsetto interface with one another, um, but also lyrically. Uh, you know, there, there's uh, you know I ended with the Yoruba lyrics because no one ever talks about that they actually <laughs> use Yoruba in their albums. You know, so it's that combination. But I really you know I uh, the falsetto stuff is stuff that I want to work with um, more and that I will be talking to you about um, because. I do think that there's there's something going on with with memory and 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 the falsetto that that I haven't quite worked through that also applies to the ways that they're kind of playing around with um, black masculinity politics on the on the on the album and I'm not so sure I completely buy Mark Neal's reading of hypermasculinity and falsetto I just I just kind of like that line I want to use it <laughs> but I do think um, I do think it 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 it's a way of kind of <coughs> complicating historical memory by using falsetto and the drone in combination with the yeah. So um, just, just real quickly, yeah. how do you situate the drone and the falsetto relative to <coughs> um, kind of standard mm -hmm. indie rock sort of drone mm, right. uh, vocalization? Right, 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 right. I mean, like when you think of and yeah. the drone, when you yeah, think of a band great. that last year got mm -hmm. so much, well, not band, but a mm -hmm. kind of subset of a band like Panda Bear, mm -hmm. you know, oh, like yeah. Am Collective, like all those yeah, droning yeah, yeah. repetitions. Yeah, yeah, How does yeah. TV on the radio's mm -hmm. droning mm -hmm. render them distinct mm -hmm. from? Mm -hmm. is, do they require mm -hmm. the falsetto mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make the droning something different as well? To or? me, it's the juxtaposition, but I should really play around with this more, and I've been trying to work with some of my musicologist friends to talk to me more about the different kind of distinctions in drones, which I'm still honest to God just learning at the most, bas most basic level. But I do think, you know, the thing about their singing styles, which is so fascinating to me, is there is a heterogeneity there that's that is is always historicized. You know, people talk about the kind of otherworldly barbershop quintet kind of um, 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 choruses that they that they draw from that I think are put into conversation with different kind of more familiar uses of the falsetto that we might even imagine in here in our R and B um, subgenres. So. Mm -hmm. It's that heterogeneity that is what's so fascinating to me sonically about them. Um, music. Um, yeah. I don't know, you may have mentioned that I came in late um, on Sasha Ferrer Jones. Ah! We only have an hour. But um, I, I, I couldn't help but, but yeah. sort of think of that and listen to your, your thoughts. Um, and it seemed that, you know, in, in saying he, he was implicitly sort of calling on white musicians to kind of reclaim the middle space. Mm -hmm. of, you know, the rock is kind of a miscegenated form, so mm -hmm. why are all the white musicians, you know, totally arrhythmic? Why don't they come back mm -hmm. you know, and claim the middle space? And it just strikes me that... But that's not actually what he said. That was part of the problem. I mean, you said that much more beautifully than what he said. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I got from what he was saying. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not a music expert. But <laughs> so it seems there's something that strikes me about this and, and, and just tied in this sort of broader political thing. You have Barack Obama <laughs> running on something that people say, well, he sounds like Bobby Kennedy. Of course, Bobby Kennedy sounds like Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. It's like there's this sort of reversal now where mm -hmm. the middle, what was really always a middle space but mm -hmm. had to be white, now the middle space is, mm -hmm. you know, whites don't take the middle mm -hmm. space. So then there's this new sort of, I don't know, is that... That completely wrong. Mm. Reading. I'm not that familiar with this piece. No, you you're pointing to many of the complexities of that piece, which um, many people have responded to, and I think that's really important. I guess to me, I was just kind of concerned with that piece, how it um, essentialized rhythm, how mm. it um, corporalized black people in ways that denied them a kind of sonic complexity that right. 
um, a particular kind of sonic complexity. It narrowed our understanding of um, like what black sound was, you know, how that was supposed to be transmitted. So, um, and he was actually in the audience when I first presented this, so he did not listen to me. But, <laughs> I'm kidding, I read, he was there. But, um, so I think we're, we're oppositional in terms of the things that we're fetishizing, and I certainly would say I'm fetishizing, you know, certain ideas, right? In this paper, it's almost kind of an overt gesture of trying to um, fetishize some kind of counterintuitive notions of black sound. Is that a problem? Sure. Right. <laughs> what do we? Where do we go with that? You know. But yeah. Thank you. Let's play more music. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I, I find uh, so interesting about being on the radio is that is there a doo wop or uh, yeah doo wop right uh, and doo wop in the forties and fifties was mm -hmm. uh, primarily African American. Mm -hmm. uh, Kind of music with like the five keys, the Orioles, the that's the right, characters. yeah. So, yeah, um, and what and then doo wop went on to actually influence uh early hip hop and, and rap, mm -hmm. and which is also you know mm -hmm. more, more identified as a black movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would you, do you have any opinions on just you know how yeah. TV on the radio kind of skips the hip hop and the rap and kind of mm -hmm. just goes right back to the 40s and 50s doo wop? Yeah, I don't want to give up the hip hop, although I'm I'm obviously less inclined to, you know, um, incorporate it in the central narrative that I'm trying to tell right now. But I think in terms of production and 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 sampling, there are certain things happening with TV on the radio that kind of align them with more transnational hip hop, hip hop like yeah. tricky, right, in certain ways. But I also think the doo wop sort of illusions in terms of um, historicizing the music and also thinking about kind of spatiality in relation to um, the, the the work that they're producing is important because if we think of doo-wop as being kind of this community, this outdoor community-based collaborative kind of project, I think that was what I was trying to sort of begin to work on a little bit with thinking about conviviality and the local and the ways that there's something resonant about these kind of allusions to doo-wop that take you back to thinking about localized aesthetic production and collaborative production that's historicized in relation to black communities. So thank you for bringing that up. Appreciate it. Say. Your rhythmics? You didn't envisionize. A, you didn't envision envisionize. You didn't envision anything when you heard your rhythmics. Talk about their title. I don't. Yeah. I just wonder if there's any relationship there. Yeah, that's right. Where does innovation arise, though? I'm kind of I'm trying to think about where to go with that. Where? What is the most innovative way that they're interfacing what sound and the visual in their music? Is that what you? Or when is it that we really feel like we've heard something new? That nobody's done it before. Oh. We're saying something different in a, in a different register than we're used to hearing. Well, I mean, I feel like black people <laughs> don't get to often, <laughs> I mean, I think they're, black artists sometimes are, are so constricted in terms of how they're allowed to be read as innovative. You know, I would want to kind of fully think about the intersectional um, issues that are embedded in that question that are interesting, right? Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely, I absolutely would like to think more about 
the group's title. Amazingly, I haven't worked on that or talked about that. But I certainly, obviously, there's something so evocative and visual and cinematic about their sound um, and how they transmit and transmutate tropes of the visual into kind of a sonic register is really fascinating. And maybe that kind of, that's a defamiliarizing move that then causes you to have questions about how you place it, you know, temporally, culturally, et cetera, et cetera. So that's useful. Thank you. Thanks, Daphne. That was a beautiful talk. And I was really struck by um, your use of Fortnite Spillers to mm -hmm. unpack um, mm -hmm. TV on the radio. And I wonder if you want to think mm -hmm. about um, Spillers for the falsetto mm -hmm. a little bit. And yeah. The, you know, the yeah. what she talks about, not just disruptive kinship, but also mm -hmm. disruption of the site of gender difference. Yes, right, that's right, that's right, yeah, yeah that's right. Right, 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 the ways that the, the commodity then denies, right, this kind of, right, gender differentiation. That's interesting. But see, the tension I'm having is between, on the one hand, it was where I was kind of going at the end with, Adabemfe's interest in, in Nina mm -hmm. and Nina as being, you know, potentially this, um, you know, androgynous sure. kind of vocal space, right? So does that then kind of, could that open up to these larger questions about forced migration that complicate our notions of, right? But then the drone is also ambiguity. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. When no, that's really useful. But I also, you know, your work and the fabulous, as everyone should know, Judith has this amazing piece that I just taught last week. Ann Chang and I taught on Big Mama Thornton and Sylvester and the falsetto. Um, you know, right, I don't, I'm trying to think about the ways that you've recuperated the falsetto as feminized and also queer in very important ways. So I'm not quite sure where to go with it. I feel like there are tales that are being told about masculinity mm -hmm. in their work that I haven't completely they worked out. They seem different. They don't seem yeah. to be the queer. Right. The false right. It seems to be more of that disruption. Right. Of that the drone is, is performing a similar kind of disruption. Right. Disruption of difference. Yes. Right. Now that's really, really useful, Judith. I want to I wanna keep thinking about that. So thank you. All right. Can I pick up on that real quick? Yes, please. I think also to the question about a network where drone functions as a kind of as a kind of dominant musical language, which yes. is in a lot of a lot of North Indian classical. Music. Right. Yep. And so that in North Indian ragas, right, where the drone right. is the dominant thing, ragas are used to ritualize yes. the passing of time during the day. Mm -hmm. So you have a raga in the morning, you have a raga mm -hmm. in the night, the that's raga great. the sun comes up and it's incremental. No? Yeah, that's great. And so I think that there's something there about mm -hmm. even that, not to Mm -hmm. Not to overly trope the queer here, but that, that the idea of, of passing across time, mm -hmm. right, and passing across a movement, mm -hmm. but in incremental ways, is right. really interesting. Yeah, uh, I, I and also passing itself. Yeah, I mean, yeah. because there's a way that you know those the as as black migrant subjects meeting up in Williamsburg, and it actually gets to Sitek again, who I, I, I do that as a joke now, like I'm gonna get to <laughs> right now, but I do I think right the kind the sort of ways in which identities are passed over and there's, you know, racial chiasmus at work in their performances is something to think about. So that trope of passing. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what about, have you read or heard anything about uh, the kind of bands that the radio associates with? Mm. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. No, band. I had a whole oh, section yeah. on the police and I took it out. <laughs> I know. It was a whole thing about invisible sentence. That's actually where the title came from. Um, because they, they, they really, right, they they work, right, in the downtown indie scene yeah. with the yeah, yeah, yes. But I've been more interested in the ways that they talk about influence and about compressed sound and space in relation to the police. They love the police, and I'm like, oh, this is just so rich because you get these crazy like Anglo-American band doing this, you know, post-colonial thing of taking reggae and you know reproducing it. Um, but I was trying to think more about the ways that they kind of use sparseness in similar ways to the police and what that says about space and the ways that they're reconfiguring space in their music. So and, and I mean, the way yes. that they use static similar Absolutely. to like George Clinton. Absolutely. And they they've opened for um, for George Clinton in the past and have talked about kind of 
what they learned from listening to, especially those early Funkadelic and Parliament records, which is really a fascinating and rich kind of connection to. So yeah, thank you for that. That's yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is actually a nice segue. Uh, 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 <laughs> like a, a band I, uh, <laughs> I, I kind of identify them with is also Donald Barkley. Oh uh, yeah, sure. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, one, because they both have very, it's hard to categorize their sound. And yeah. That, uh, they're both uh, groups with that of mixed race. Right. Uh, with Danger Mouse. And, and also the falsetto, CeeLo's falsetto. And, 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 well, I, I which was, I think uh, is really queer, actually, the ways that he's, I mean, in yeah. really interesting ways. Yeah. And what I was, what I was wondering mm-hmm. was that it, maybe that perhaps that, you know, the secret or to what makes the music so unique, kind of like the, 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 the you know, amalgamation of the two worlds of, you know, white and black, you know, the, you know, the, mm. the cooperation of, you mm-hmm. know, two different viewpoints, you mm-hmm. know, that goes back, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years mm-hmm. still, like, is that perhaps what makes the unique sound? You know? I mean, I think that's a great question. I'm interested in encounter, racialized encounters and how they work out <coughs> sonically. Absolutely. I mean, we can talking about this in Toronto on Friday night, that we have to think of the blues as as a genre that's about racialized encounter. If we think about Jewish white coon shatters like Sophie Tucker performing the recorded blues before Mamie Smith, who was African American, and used and picked up on and retransmitted many of the gestures that Sophie Tucker used, which were drawn from blackface minstrelsy. So that kind of those kinds of encounters, gestural encounters um, in sound and, and music that are racialized are really fascinating and obviously extend back through the history of American popular music culture. So thank you for that observation. Just a kind of little quirky question. Yes. About conviviality. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not <laughs> a core question about conviviality. Yeah. The kind of homosocial world yeah. that we're working in. Yes. I mean, it also, in particular, kind of masculinity. Yeah. Kind of indie. Right. Sociality, yes. And how maybe that form of conviviality is only possible right. in that kind of gender yes. you know, dynamic, I, right? Yeah. The boys who get to play with their toys. Exactly. I, th- I think, and, you know, yes. And I'm just curious about how that fits in, though, with the rest mm-hmm. of your work, actually, mm-hmm. and also with what would happen, you know, how we might reread Nina Simone, the use of Nina Simone's voice, mm-hmm. or kind of think about that as an intervention to that that experience, that version of conviviality. Yeah. Oh, that's great. You just answered it, Karen. That's fabulous. (laughs) (laughs) No, No, but, I mean, you know, what's interesting is um, right now, you know, Nina's getting recuperated as an icon in all of these (coughs) different contemporary contexts, but I've, I've encountered her more as being someone who's embraced with the exception of Mary J. Blige, who's trying to make a Nina Simone film, God, don't let that happen. <laughs> but um, by by um, by men. So John Legend, who's very interesting and intellectualizes racial and gender politics all the time. But um, uh, Taleb, who you know samples her constantly. So you know, right? Can she be kind of an intervention? Does she have an interventionist iconicity, or does she get reincorporated then into certain kinds of? Or she gets to be the girl, like Karen right. O. Right, right, <laughs> exactly, like Karen O. Right, who gets to be the girl? Yeah, we should think more about that. But absolutely, especially right with the Williamsburg scene, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's helpful to think about. Yeah. Yes. Suggest that you um, yes. also include Alice culture. Oh. And Pharaoh. Oh my God! Absolutely. 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 Right. And you know, Radiohead just completely embraces Alice Coltrane. Yeah, that's you really. Can bring it back in. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really great. That's really great, and gets you to to Raga too, in many ways, right? So that's great. Thank you. One more question. Um, well, I was wondering about the ground and sort of um, its production and maybe the relationship between mm-hmm. the way it gets produced and certain uh, practices associated with dub. Mm-hmm. And then um, on the Bomb Yourself track, it yeah. doesn't really evoke something wrong. I guess that kind of yeah. stuff that like, goes back to your police. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's and right. I know that dub is like, I don't know if it's like overdone as a DS4 practice. Mm-hmm. 
That is a direction I should head in. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, right, the, the, that you mentioned overdone, I think, is interesting because I do think that they're, they're a band that's interested in trying to address and then transform cliches, sonic cliches in their music. So I'm wondering if there's a way that, that the dub is repeated and then defamiliarized in their music that I should think about more. Um, yeah, no, thank you. That's very that's very useful to think about. Thank you, Daphne. Yeah, thank you. Um, if anybody does want to hang around and uh, talk more informally um, about music, uh, maybe thank we'll talk so about Amy Winehouse. Um, feel free to stick around. We've got At some point. <laughs> I'm going to listen to it again, yeah. but I would love to read it. Oh, well, thank <laughs> you. Yeah.